welcome everybody. Um, my name is Karen Hadley. I'm the director of the Institute of Business Industry and Leadership, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the University of Cumbria London campus, albeit virtually for most of you, um, for a lecture from Professor John Sidney. Uh, John is a professor of practice within the Institute, having joined us in, this is where John, you're going to say I'm wrong on this, February 2021. Um, that's right. Perhaps at the end of potentially one of the most significant, if not the most significant disruption in the global supply chain that we could have ever imagined. Uh, from 2010 to 2013, John was head of supply chain strategy with Sellafield and from 2013 head of category management before joining the university in 2021. Um, whilst with us, not only as has John fostered um, uh, a significant number of key relationships with leading businesses uh, in the Northwest, um, many of which have a national presence, even though they've kind of got a base here. Um, he's led the development of the Institute's undergraduate degree in supply chain and logistics, which continues to grow and to develop and, and take more and more students on. So in terms of uh, the subject of tonight's lecture, and I'm really hoping that I'm not going to potentially tread on John's toes in any of this, Putting aside the the impact of the pandemic, it seems like uh, kind of broken supply chains are increasingly part of our regular news agenda. Um, I'm sure you will all recall 2021, the evergreen container ship running aground, um, blocking uh, shipping for six days in the Suez Canal, one of the world's busiest shipping routes, particularly in terms of the movement of goods from Asia to Europe. By the end of that sixth day, there were at least 369 container ships queuing to get through. Um, and I think um, it, it's surprising just how much uh, stuff is, is on the, each one of those container ships. Um, a report in 2022 suggested that 58% of UK businesses thought that their supply chains needed either a lot of or significant improvements. 84% indicated that they were planning on moving from a just-in-time model, which prioritises costs in the selection of suppliers uh, above everything else, to a just-in-case approach. Uh, more recently, we've had the impact of activities um, in the Red Sea that have affected the, uh, uh, the trade crossing um, the, the water there. And the, that's impacted on the availability of tea, God forbid, as well as Nike, Ikea and others citing the same issues as the cause for disruptions in their supply chain. We currently have a significant shortage of many medications in the UK, again, due to the situation in the Red Sea, issues following Brexit and also government policy. And of course, most recently and perhaps most fresh in our minds, um, we've had the warnings about the availability of cars, coal, gas uh, as a result of the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore. Um, I also came across something in, in preparing for this recently about more and more companies um, in the UK are looking at resourcing as opposed to outsourcing a lot of their business. And I've never come across the notion of resourcing before, but you can understand perhaps with all of the, the events that, that um, have that adverse impact on our supply chains, why organisations are, are considering that approach. So John's lecture will consider the global supply chain networks, their impact on our everyday lives, and also their impact on the environment for good and for ill. At the end of the lecture, uh, there will be an opportunity for questions and something of a discussion between us, I hope, um, and hopefully you'll all feel able to, to engage with that. So following on from that then, I will hand over to John. Uh, thank you, John, for agreeing to do this, uh, and over to you. Thanks, Karen, and a really good introduction. And um... Yes, that's pretty much my lecture. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case I have prepared a few slides. Um, so so the, 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 the presentation is called The Invisible Fabric of Society. It's about the things that we don't see or can't see that actually control our everyday life. And I'm inspired, I've always been inspired by this particular person, W. Brian Arthur. And this is one of my favourite quotations of anybody. And it's, the, it's not what people know that matters, it's what they take for granted. So the things that we know and understand and the things that are in our uh, higher level consciousness, the things that we act on, 
And things that we take for granted are things that we don't even see and they can govern our behaviour and govern our futures, but we don't actually examine them. We just de we just allow them to, to, uh, to control us. And when I um, first got into this particular field, I thought this was going to be really easy compared to what I'd done when I did my PhD. My PhD was in multi-phase flow um, measurements, which, which um, I thought, well, that sounds really interesting. It's very, it's very good. There has to be drinks I can, I can use. But when I got into it, the first thing I found is that there was absolutely zero empirical basis to work from. So there's no measurements, no correlations. You know, if you think of Newton, you drop a, a, a ball, you can predict when it hits the ground, it can have the equations just by drawing the ground. Whereas in the field I went into, there was no empirical basis whatsoever. So there's no kind of scientific uh, level that we could start from. So my job in many ways was to actually try and build that empirical basis. And then I um, moved various through various roles. And about 10 years ago, I picked up a role, key role in, in managing the supply chain for a, a very large company. And I thought well, this is going to be easy because you know, we all know what supply chains are. Supply chains are things that move things, move things, that move things, and then ultimately something happens um, at the other end. So if we look at this, you know, a model of an automotive supply chain, the first thing is it's kind of left to right. The supply chains are left to right. At least that's what we thought. Um, and also the volume linear. So something comes out of one part of the supply chain, moves into another part of the supply chain, and another part, and another part. So it's always kind of like a stepwise process, something we can predict and something that we control. And then I actually started looking at it seriously and found that actually supply chains are in the same category that I found multi-phase flow in. That we, there's so much about supply chains that have been unexamined that my belief is, and one of the reasons why I'm keen to give this lecture is I would really like anybody who has any advice for me or any uh, input that I could have. Because I think that we we don't really understand even how to study supply chain yet. Um, so that, that's where that's where we're, we're going to go. Common phrase is called the supply chain. People say, oh, you know, this supply chain, the global supply chain, this supply chain. It doesn't exist. There's no such thing as the supply chain because supply chains evolve without change. So there is a thing. And this is one of the immediate traps. This is one of the immediate things we take for granted as we think of the supply chain as a thing rather than as a process or rather than an emergent phenomenon. So we, we should stop thinking of the supply chain and start to think about it in terms of its true behaviours. One of the ways I like to think about supply chains is to think about them as fire. We're probably all familiar with the fire triangle, the combination of oxygen, heat and fuel. Um, generates fire, creates fire. But if we take oxygen away, fire um, dies. If we take the heat away, if we take the fuel away, fire dies. You know, if we think of you know smothering a, uh, an oil fire with foam, for instance. Um, now, supply chains, I think, operate to to a very similar principle. But their three elements of the triangle are um, the first thing is infrastructure. So they're the things that actually make the supply chain work. There's a thing called trust, and trust is about the contracts, the regulations. It's so that you know when we buy something and consume it, we believe that we're going to remain healthy, it's not going to kill us, we're going to be safe with it. And then the demand is about you know us, the buyers, it's about the predictive modeling that we have, and it's also about things like risk management. So I believe that a supply chain, my current working theory of supply chains, is that a supply chain emerges when those three conditions are met. When you have a condition where you have the infrastructure, you have the trust and you have the demand, and that generates the creation of the supply chain. Then if you look at the top left there, you know, we've got an aeroplane, we've got packaging, we've got a supplier. At the bottom left on that diagram is a bridge. So the first question is, is a bridge part of a supply chain? Exactly. So is a bicycle part of a supply chain? It is when the delivery room guy is delivering our pizza, but once that person parks that bicycle, it's no longer part of a supply chain, it's just a bicycle. 
So any of these elements could just be an element, it could just be bridge, or it could be key infrastructure for a supply chain, like we saw in, in Baltimore um, a couple of weeks ago. So that was just a bridge. It wasn't a supply chain, it wasn't part of the supply chain, but then all of a sudden it was part of the supply chain because of the blocks and the many ships in, in the harbour. So that's something as well, I think, um, to consider that, is that um, the, the elements of the supply chain are temporary, transient. They're either in a supply chain under certain conditions, or under other conditions they're not. An aeroplane is not in a supply chain when it's being prepared. So, so it's a it's it's kind of a more of a concept and a set of paradigms. So this is work in practice, uh, sort of work in, in progress. So I'm trying to think of, you know, how would you define a supply chain? And I've started off with these three statements. So the first thing is the supply chain is a dynamic network. It's a network that changes and adapts. It's not a fixed name, it's not a fixed network. Some might look like a fixed network. So for instance, you know, if you look at in a in a hospital, for instance, the delivery of medicines through to treatment might be that for many, many years. But in the long term, it's dynamic because different medicines uh, appear, different treatments appear, people use things in different ways, and people discover things. I'll talk a little bit about emergence as we go through this, but I believe the supply chain is an emergent property of relationships between customers and suppliers. So we might have a relationship as a customer and a supplier, but that but the supply chain only occurs when we make that deal and we, there's a demand and there's a, there's a um, supply. And generally, a supply chain contains a sequence of trades and transformations. Now, we tell us a sequence, but I think sequence bit is important. So the trade is the deal, it's the deal we make. The transformation is what we do. So if I, um, you know, if I take, um, if, I, if I buy cement and bricks, we'll talk about cement and bricks, if I buy cement and bricks, that's the trade. The transformation is I build a wall. The next trade is I sell you the wall, the completed wall, and then that continues and you might then build a house or build a garden or whatever that might be. So it's a sequence, it's things that happen in sequence, and it's trades and transformations, and the transformations are really important. And then just as a kind of provocative thing, I, I, I've, I've thought about this for three or four years now, probably since, since I joined university. I cannot think of anything that we can see or touch, or anything we will see or touch, which has never been part of the supply chain. So if you look around the room like this, or if you're watching online, look around the room you're in, Apart from maybe us, which is debatable, everything in here has at some point been part of the supply chain. And everything in here at some point may well be part of the future supply chain. So we could sell the projector, we could recycle the wooden beams. Everything is. So the supply chain is actually the thing we live in. It's the, the, the artifacts of the supply chain, the things that we live in, an area that we exist in. And the supply chain is almost like the, the, the ligaments, the tendons, the things that tie our part of society together. So why not just make it all ourselves? And this comes from um, some work that I, I looked at. I couldn't actually find a reference when I was looking for this, but it was, um, I think it's, I think it's Gregory Bateson. And he was talking about two societies. There's a coastal society and an inland society. Bateson was a, a renowned uh, anthropologist. And what they found was that the inland society were excellent at growing rice, and they obviously the coastal community were excellent at fishing. But uh, between them, because they could both specialise, they could actually both uh, communities could have a balanced diet of carbohydrate and protein. There's more to it than this, but this is a very simple way of looking at it. So the specialisation, the, the division of labour is enabled by supply chains. It enables it because if I want to, you know, if I want to build something, I can actually buy the components. I don't have to make all of the components myself. So I can buy components from people who have made them. I can build them and sell them onto somebody else that can't do the building that I do. So, um, so the, the division of labor is one of the key facets of the supply chain. It's what, one of the things that enables. And through division of labour, we then get um, a concept in, I think it's in economics, called comparative advantage, which is not competitive advantage. Comparative advantage means that together we can actually create more wealth 
by dividing our labour than we could by doing everything in, individually. So actually it's about wealth creation. And that's what produces the supply chain in the impulse. And then really just, just to put the kind of full stop on this bit. So what's the purpose of, of supply chain management? I was in supply chain management for 20 years um, and a senior role for 10 years. Um, and my job was to optimize the performance of the supply chain. That's a, it's very difficult to do. And traditionally, so my job was to reduce the cost to our company. It was to maintain the quality and to provide resources to the company. And then over the past uh, five to 10 years, an awful lot of the supply chain has been about demonstrating environmental responsibility and socially sustainable uh, actions as well. When I first got into this business, people wouldn't talk about their supply chains. They talk about the products. They talk about the things they made. So if it was, you know, a, a shirt, it would be the shirt that they made would be the thing you talk about. Now people are more likely going to talk about the supply chain that made the shirt. It's sustainable. It comes from a good a, a grower of cotton, which is sustainable cotton. Uh, the, it's a fair wage economy, which, you know, creates the, the garment. People are going to talk more and more about their supply chains. As Karen said, this is the this is the latest thing. Uh, is resilience, and, and my working theory on this is that we drove lean supply chains to a point where they became unsustainable, and then certain shocks created very very severe disruptions in the supply chains, and then you know we've we've seen the extreme ones. So resilience, you know, the idea of just in case rather than just in time. And this is also where I think the onshoring comes as well. The idea of, of offshoring creates um, a, a longer supply chain to manage rather than a short supply chain. The fundamental building block, the thing that also let me add to them, you know, the Higgs boson, if you like, of, of supply chains is this. It's the seller and the buyer getting together. And, you know, I'm talking to business lecturers, so you may well, you know, if, if if you if you want to um, criticize me, please please do. This is my understanding of how the buyer and the seller make that deal. The first thing is the buyer makes an offer. I would like to buy this thing from you. The seller then accepts that and says, yes, okay, let's buy that. So if I want to buy your car of somebody, I'll say, can I buy the car, please? And I would pay ten thousand pounds for that car. The seller says, that's a good that's a good price. You can have my car. And then I pay the ten thousand pounds for compensation. So that structure, the offered acceptance and compensation, is universal and has been universal for many, many, many years, um, probably millennia. Um, but that's that's the, the core thing. That's the thing. That's the spark that starts the supply chain to happen. And you know, as, as any of us in business knows, contracts can be long form, written, signed, signed under seal with legal this, that, and the other, and, and you know even you know wax seals on them in, in certain circumstances but they can also be a handshake so um you know i would like to buy your lawnmower i'm not going to write a written contract for my neighbor when i buy their lawnmower i'm just going to shape it and that would be the, the contract and then there are contracts all the way through we probably engage in many more contracts than we're than we're conscious of in, in our everyday life in every single day that we that we that we exist that we walk around we live We'll engage in all sorts of contracts. Every time, you know, I turn on a streaming service, every time I turn on Netflix, I'm engaging in a contract because the rules that, that govern our, our interaction with that, uh, with that system. And then there's an example which I, which I use with students, which is um, a contract. This is a contract I entered into earlier. So I go into the, into the news agent and I said, I'd like to buy a Snickers bar, please. And the news agent says, Certainly, sir. And then I pay the price of the Snickers bar, you know, each or whatever it is. But built into that, there is a contract. So the first thing is, there's a thing on it which says there's one of them and it's 48 grams. So if I have that Snickers bar and it's 47 grams, I have taught, I can claim, I can sue. So there's actually a written contract between us, even though no one's saying anything. And it gets, you know, really, um, Involved, so there's a best before date on it. I know this is an old one, but the best before date. So if I eat that bar before the best before date and I become ill, then it's the vendor's uh, responsibility 
If I need that, if I still had that, and it was 2022 and it's not going to go on I wouldn't have any claim on that. So within that, there's a condition of contract built into that. And then there's a scope of contract. So the scope is built into this as well. It tells me what is in the product. It also highlights any allergens. So this, within the scope, there's allergens. So if I'm allergic to peanuts, I wouldn't probably buy a secret buyer from allergic to peanuts. But if I if I was allergic to peanuts and I ate that bar and I had anaphylactic shock and I was seriously ill, I wouldn't have any comeback on that vendor. So that's a really quite complicated, quite involved, quite detailed contract that just simply buying a chocolate bar. And that happens to us all the time. So these contracts are everywhere. And that's when I, when I talk about the invisible fabric of society, we're probably not aware of 99% of the contracts that we enter into. And supply chains get, compl get complicated really, really quickly, uh, particularly global contracts, um, particularly global supply chains. Sorry. So, so this is an example. This is a this is a shampoo bottle, a real real bottle of shampoo that was was in my bathroom, um, and. I thought, well, I, I wonder where all of the things in that bottle of shampoo come from. Where did that actually come from? What are they? So I looked at these, there were 27 ingredients in there, and I picked one ingredient, um, and I'll probably get tongue twisted on this, but methyl isothiol is so like, it's one ingredient. So it's been one ingredient with the 27. So this is it, methyl isothiol is on. What I found is that that's made by amortization of methyl 3 the capture pro pinet and uh, methyl three etc that had about 10 precursor compounds not always used at all times but there were about 10 compounds that could be used to make that so that's 10 don't forget this is one out of 27 i've picked one um one of those out of 27 and already there are 10 possible routes to get to that product then from one of those routes, I picked this one, three Mercaptor Pro Pionic Acid, and I found there were nine routes to get to that. One of the routes is this one, which is mixing, um, combining hydrogen sulfide with acrylic acid. Acrylic acid is made by the oxidization of propylene. Propylene is made by the steam cracking of propane. Propane is a byproduct of the production of gasoline, and gasoline is made by steam cracking with crude oil. So, in that one in that one compound of those 27 in that one bottle which i picked randomly in my bathroom i found that there's a global supply chain for that one compound i also found as well that even though the bottle is recyclable every time i wash my hair i am putting hydrocarbons into the environment because this comes from a hydrocarbon um, supply chain which we should never thought of all this is public domain information. So I use um, this of things like the evaluation of certain food additives and contaminants. It's all public domain, but it would take weeks and weeks for me to analyze that one bottle of shampoo to understand all of the supply chains that were possible to come into that. So, so you know, hopefully you can see, see what I mean in terms of we are surrounded by this complexity. We're surrounded by this multitude of different ways that we live our lives. And it's a supply chain that we, we often cannot see. And this is this is a, a proposition that, that I made, which, which may or may not be true, but, but I believe that supply chains may be the most complex machine ever created by humanity. So this is the um, the, uh, the English Channel. It was um, a couple of years ago, and I used a, a thing called vessel finding to look at it. So if you if you look on this on this graph, and if you, you might not be able to see this if you're online, but if you see where Calais is, there are green triangles. They're ferries, they're car ferries that run between Dover and Calais. And then up to the right is Rotterdam, which is one of the biggest container ports in, in, in the world. And what it is, I just recorded it over three hours. Just took, some, just took screenshots and overlaid them and set it up as a, as a small animation. The yellow elements on there are container ships. So 
you know, we, we think, well, you know, container ship is big. But when there are dozens and dozens every hour coming through that, uh, through those straits, they're going into Rotterdam and then being cross docked and then being sent to other places. And, and this is tiny. You look at Long Beach in, uh, on the west coast of America. That is madness. Look at Singapore. My goodness, the, the volume. So the volume trade comes through um, the, the, the we create through our supply chains is absolutely huge. And every single one of these is a very complex machine in itself. So you think of levels and levels and levels and levels of complexity. So if my shampoo bottle is in one of those ships, I've got that. It's almost like a, it's almost like a, 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 a fractal environment in terms of you've got this massively complex thing, which is just in one bottle. You might have thousands or tens of thousands of them in one crate. And you might have hundreds, if not thousands, of crates in one, uh, of, of containers on one ship. It's, it's, it's almost impossible to conceive of how huge the supply chain is. But we can't see it. So this, this, is, this is the best I could think of in terms of how we see the supply chain. We see it at one point in time. So if I buy something, so something like this, so I've, I've, you know, I've got my own um, clip, which I use for my lecturing, bought it from Amazon. The bit of the supply chain I see is when the dark blue van pulls up in front of my house and the person walks out of the van and knocks on my door and hands you the parcel. So I only see that tiny bit of that overall thing. And it's incredibly difficult. I don't think we've got a methodology yet to look longitudinally through supply chains effectively. All we can see is we can see cross sections, cross sections, which is the other thing about them being invisible. They might not be actually invisible, but they are not visible to us. Uh, and part of the research that, um, that I'm looking at is to, is to look at how complexity theory can inform our understanding of supply chains. So supply chains are no doubt they're complicated. They made up of many, many, many components, but they're also complex because they're affected by feedback and feedback can change the way that they operate. And again, these are things which are just in plain sight. So this is my Venn diagram of the complexity. The first thing is, this is the set of everything that can be made, everything that anyone can make. And then the next one is the set of everything people will buy. Because if you're not going to buy and sell it, there isn't a supply chain. So I can make things for myself. So I might make a painting for myself. It's not part of the supply chain. Because if you bought a painting that I made, you would probably be wasting the money. But, but, but you see what I mean? I can make things, but I can't always sell things. So things have got to be able to be made and things that people will buy. And then in the middle, it's everything the supply chain can content. So to get from the seller to the buyer, there has to be an accommodation in that supply chain. It has to be possible for the things to be to fit in time in the supply chain. So if you look at those ships with those containers, you know, the containers might be, you know, I think the US containers are about 40 feet long. If you had something which was 41 feet, it's not going to go in that container. So you're probably going to make it 39 feet long. So you're actually going to change the product because of the supply chain that you're going to use in order to deliver that one. Um, and there's so many factors. And you're going to be able to produce it economically. It's going to be affordable. It's going to be describable. Um, if you go to a, uh, if, if I go to my local post office and I post a parcel, the um, person behind the counter will often say to me, what within the parcel? And I'll have to describe what's in the parcel. I'll have to say it is socks for my grandchild. You know, I can't say it is a gun or it is an explosive device or it is a noxious chemical because then it would never get posted. So things have to, you have to be able to describe things in order to happen in the supply chain. And this is um, Keith, um, I think his name's Tatlinger, the guy in the middle. And he was, I believe he was, there's many, many debates on this. I believe he's the, the person that invented the ice and the uh, And it, the ice break container is a, is a marvellous thing because it can be transshipped, so it can be taken on rail, it's multi-modal, it can be taken on trucks, it can be taken on ships. Um, it's quantifiable, it's got um, 
uh, it, it, it's got a, a, a dimension, so it, so you know it will go underneath railway bridges and all these type of things. So so it's actually a defined space. So that what the container does, it creates almost like a space and a space in 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 the world. Um, and then obviously we've got the, the handling equipment and so on. But because of temperature and venting this device, um, so much of the supply chain then changed because they realised that the cost base of using this device was much lower than, for instance, bulk shipping in bulk was, you know, and then used to work. Um, my father used to be in the in the merchant marine and merchant navy, and he talks about slimming things um, on into holes, you know, from slimming to Liverpool or, or wherever wherever it was. That would not just be in a in a in an ice break down stand. It would say. 20 seconds, 30 seconds to move that onto the, uh, onto the ship. Um, a new thing about it is it creates a queue, which those of us in logistics understand. It means that you can then quantify the, the used space and wasted space. So you know how much, how efficient the system is. So if you're thinking of how can I make the system more efficient, and I've got 90% of the container is full, I can think, well, what would fill that 10%? I know, I know how big it is, I know its dimensions. So you can gradually improve your efficiency of your transformation. But it even works. I think it does. Okay? I think it even works for things which we're familiar with. Okay, so we look at that, that's a, you know, a dairy cow. Um, and that's how we consider it as a product. So as a product, we consider the cow as a set of uh, meat products, usually meat products. There are other things, you know, also. Um, other, other things as well, but generally meat products. So we so that, that cow is divided into a set of products, but that cow has to work with the supply chain it's part of. So it has to be transportable. It has to be able to be slaughtered and butchered. And it has to be able to be cooked. But even more than that, if we look at you know the butcher's counter, it has to sell. It's no good having something which can be transported, which goes behind the counter which just stays there and doesn't sell. It's got to sell. And when it sells, it's got to be able to prepare, be prepared. And people have got to taste it and think that was really good. So the entire uh, system for which that cow is the object involves that cow over time. Of the time. Because, uh, you know, 5,000 years ago, that would have been an oil for instance, probably, or something like this. So that cow is not a natural product. When we when we look at nature and you know we see sheep or we see cows or we see pigs or whatever, they're not natural. They're created because the system and particularly the supply chain they're part of means that they're more efficient in that form than they might have been in the form in the form previously. So again, my um, proposition for this is that the feedbacks within the supply chain shape the products that we use, um, and even the production facilities that create them. Perhaps a more familiar one is, if people, are, um, if any, anyone is keen on music, is the, the invention of the transistor radio and that supply chain from the recording studio through to us as the consumer listening, um, was limited by bandwidth because of the FM and AM radio. So actually, the music had to be compressed. So we became familiar with popular music, particularly in a compressed form. You know, heavy bass and then so on. Um, very, very small dynamic range. So the thing that we think of as popular music by the radio is actually an artifact. It's a, it's an emerging uh, property of the supply chain that's used to deliver it. These things are everywhere. Abs absolutely, absolutely everywhere. Payment slabs. This is how common emergency is. So if you look in, in this form of um, a wooden flooring, which looks like parking flooring, um, the, the slabs have to be handleable, they have to be stackable, they have to be uniform, they have to be designable. So people, you know, an architect has to say, I'm going to lay this, this slab and have to quantify it, work out how much it's going to cost. So the supply chain that they're part of, which is effectively the thing that enables their trade, um, creates the ideal slab, the ideal thing, which is the right you know, price, the right quantity and so on. So even as we walk out here this evening and we look on the floor, the, the floor that we're walking on is 
probably, I believe, probably an emerging property of the supply chain constraints. Curb storms are, for instance. Um, this is one of the things which um, it, which is, which intrigues me is this comes from Herbert Simon, um, Nobel Nobel laureate Herbert Simon, and he put, picked the simplest possible equation and showed how it was um, complex. So what we've got here is we've got the quantity of goods on the table to the supply line. So that's the things that are on order. We've got the time it takes from when they're ordered to when they're delivered. And we've got the depletion rate, the rate at which we use them. Simple, there are three extremely simple, extremely simple terms. You know, the amount that's on order, the time it takes to get here, and the rate at which we use it. Something which, you know, at school would be absolutely straightforward. But what, when Herbert Simon's looking at this, um, he said, well, what happens if you try and um, make this lean? So if you want to make it lean, you reduce the capital of employed. So one of the things you do then is you um, reduce, reduce the supply line. But then if the time taken increases too much, the supply line might not be enough. And then we get an increase in depletion through panic buying. And even through, there's many, many examples through COVID, but there's also many, many examples. You know, whenever someone says there's, there's going to be a petrol shortage, everyone fills the car up. So people have, have a water driving around with full tanks of uh, gasoline, which actually can't be sustained because there aren't enough um, huge tanks of gasoline in order to fill everyone's car up. It's a, it's a, not, uh, a belief that, you know, the average car will have 20, 30% um, gasoline. And the thing about that is the panic buying um, makes the supply line issues even worse. So what you get is you get this rampant runaway feedback and it happens before you can even know it. And it's the same process mathematically as an explosion. It's the same process as a forest fire. And it's also the same process as, um, as a pandemic um, in terms of things run away. So what Simon was saying, Herbert Simon was saying that there's a complexity in supply chains which we do not yet really understand. In supply chains, the only time we ever see them is when they go wrong. So this was the, the chip that um, Karen mentioned. I think it was ever given and you know it got stuck in the Suez Canal and it was there for a week or two and shelves started to empty. Companies went out of business because they couldn't get supplies to, to make orders. So if you can't get your supplies to meet your order, you can't get, I mean, you, you'll understand this, the death valley curve of cash. You get into that position where the bank says, hang on a second, uh, I've lent you up this overdraft, but I'm not, you're not servicing the overdraft. But the reason I'm not servicing the overdraft bank manager is because the ship with all of my goods was stuck in the service canal or either end of the service canal. The bank manager might not want to know that fact. The bank manager might not know me. So, so, so there's a severe, severe whiplash effect from something like this. But we tend to notice supply chains when they go wrong. If we go into a, a supermarket and we have a shopping list and we fill that shopping list, we just think that's normal. If we go into a supermarket and we try and fill that shopping list, and there's a key thing that's missing. You know, how many times have we gone into a shop in the supermarket you know, every now and then, and there's no milk? You think, goodness me, who? everyone buys milk. Surely everyone can. So, so you, you, you get a kind of an emotional reaction um, to a failed supply chain. But we get absolute numbness, just no feeling whatsoever of a functioning supply chain. So this is this goes back to the to the shipping, and it comes from a, a site. It's one of, one of my favourite sites. It's not a very good name, but it's one of my favourite sites it's called Windy.com, and it's a you know it, Dave. Yeah. And it and what it what it does is it um, it's like a it's like a meta data site, so it brings all sorts of different forms of data together. And this this is this is something which I, I found on windy.com. So this is obviously Western Europe. Um, and on it we have the shipping lane that comes from the Suez Canal to Rotterdam, which is the red dotted line. And one of the things I think you can see is that along that dotted line, I just cleared it out. Along that dotted line, there's an absolute clear line of nitrous oxide. So that's nitrous oxide into the into the um, atmosphere. 
And even in the Bay of Biscay, which is a very, very windy place, according to windy.com, it's a very windy place. There's still that trace of nitrous oxide in the uh, in the atmosphere. These are, these are from, uh, from satellites. And this is from Vessel Finder, which is the site I used before. And this, on that same day, this was the shipping going through um, through the mouth of the, the Mediterranean in a past, um, uh, past Gibraltar. And then if you look at the line and then map the um, map the nitrous uh, nitrous oxide emissions, you can see that the, the nitrous oxide emissions from shipping uh, are absolutely incredible the amount of, of gas. But we tend not to look there. We tend to look at, oh, my car is not very efficient, I'm going to get an electric vehicle, or something like that. We tend to have what, again, what Herbert Simon would call the availability um, heuristic. In terms of, we tend to look at things which affect us directly, not things which are not things which are global. Um, and this is kind of moving towards the moving towards the close now. We well, again, it's a it's a it's a provocation. I don't believe supply chains are really managed. I think supply relationships are managed, but not supply chains. And that's because the supply chains are really dependent. Everything affects everything else in the supply chain. But they're independently managed. We manage generally the transaction that we're dealing with now. So we look at that one transaction in a, in a, in a big line of transactions. And we have to have myopic goals. So the goals might be the lowest price. I want the lowest price for this. And that's my goal, regardless of what it, how it might affect other people. So you know, think of the social ills that are caused by the lowest price purchasing. Um, and that is what I think leads to the environment problems. And this is this is why this is where I'm where I'm kind of up to with my with my thinking on this. Is that I think this is how we think supply chains work. I think there's a transformation which adds some value. Then there's a transaction, and then we move to the next stage, and there's a transformation which adds some value. And then there's, then there's um, a, a trade, a transaction, and so on. And the supply chain continues like that. We tend to think of supply chain as being a left to right process. Inspired by um, uh, someone called John Holland, John H. Holland, uh, who is a complex, works in complexity theory in um, Santa Fe Institute, and he invented this thing called a uh, bucket brigade algorithm. And looking at how that algorithm works, this is another way I think that supply chains may work. Okay, so what you've got is you've got the consumer and five sellers, and that consumer has a picture, has a, a, a value uh, score of what they want. And it's based on quality, price, durability, warranty, delivery. So they look for the, for the best overall score that they can get from any of those five sellers. And ultimately, they pick one. So the big one sell, and the others don't get any trade from that from that consumer at all. So seller four gets all the all the trade based on that on that that netted off idea of what value is. But then if we look at that across um, a wider supply chain, so this is that consumer buying from a seller. So the green is is the 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 successful seller, and the um, the red diagram is that consumers. Um, that consumers measure of value. Then, of course, that goes through the supply chain with exactly the same process. So the seller finds the next seller and has their own picture of what value might mean. And that goes right the way through many, many layers. We don't know how many layers there might even be there, but throughout that supply chain, it's a massively, massively parallel, massively parallel process. But what happens to all the people that don't make the sale? So if you don't make the sale, you want to find out why the sale was made, because you want to improve your product, your service, in order to improve. And the way that um, John Holland would talk about it is this is kind of like an evolutionary process. So some sellers will die. Some sellers will go out of business. Other sellers will thrive. And the sellers that will thrive will expand, will grow, and, um, and multiply. 
So you effectively have a thing which is almost like a, a, a dynamic population model, but working in the supply chain. Um, it's massively parallel, which means that it's almost impossible to really measure at a precise level. You've got to look at it broadly as a system. And the other thing is that as we go through this circuit in the bottle of shampoo, as a consumer, I want an eco-friendly shampoo. So this is, you know, my my um, value uh, uh, kind of score is is high. The retailer that sells it to me, they might want an attractive stock keeping unit. They might want something I want to buy. The distributor wants something that moves fast because the distributor doesn't get paid for anything other than the turning over in their warehouse. So they want things to move through their warehouse quickly. And then when you get down to the manufacturer, the manufacturer doesn't want any of this eco rubbish. The manufacturer wants probably at the best market rate, the cheapest rate you can get it. So we end up as we go through the supply chain, it's possible that we get to lower and lower levels of consciousness, as you might think, in a psychological term. So actually the supply chain is, is, is almost um, a multiple personality activity. So there's different personalities at different levels in the, in the supply chain. And one of the things that the supply chain does is it incentivizes waste, directly incentivizes waste. So if I'm building my house, I'll buy, um, I'll buy bricks and I'll buy cement. And the person that makes the cement will buy some limestone and some clay, and the person that buys the bricks will buy some clay. So I'll buy 500 bricks and I buy 10 bags of cement. I use 450 bricks and eight and a half bags of cement. So I've got one and a half bags of cement there, and I've got 50 bricks there. They are no value to anyone, because nobody wants to buy 50 bricks, because you can't make anything out of 50 bricks. And that half a bag of cement is going to go damp, and it's going to go solid, and it's going to be ruined. Now then, if I, if I left those bricks outside of my house for a year, and the bricks got frost damaged, and I had to buy another 500 bricks, because my original 500 bricks were ruined, the brick manufacturer would rub their hands. That's good business for them. So me being wasteful, me being careless, and me being a poor manager of materials is actually good business for that supply chain. The worse the customer is at estimating, the worse the customer is at making, the worse the customer is at storing, is actually the best possible thing for that supply chain. The supply chain becomes richer the worse I am as a builder, as you know, my own um, constructor. So we have a, an incentive on that supply chain. No human might have that incentive, but the supply chain itself has an incentive to waste. That's what it's, that's what it's there to do, because that makes everyone richer. And this is a, 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 someone I used to work with a while ago, Laurie Costello, um, and he did a huge study on, um, on construction. And what we've got there is the, the red horizontal line is the market price. The blue declining line is the average purchase price, um, and that goes down as you increase the volume. So you buy one brick, one brick will probably cost as much as 10 bricks if you were to buy a thousand. Because the more you buy, the, the better price you get. Everyone knows that, you know, buy bulk. But the logistics costs, which are the which are the orange line, go up and up and up because you waste, you don't use, you have to store, it takes energy, you break things, you lose things. So, um, so the idea of bulk buying, which is we're encouraged to do, is actually incredibly wasteful, a very, very wasteful process. And this, this is, um, and this was worked on by Bosnick and Brewers. Um, they, they did it mainly in um, South America, but they covered covered areas. And these numbers are shocking. So this is CMD as construction and demolition. So in the Netherlands. The, um, okay, it was 1996, but it's not that long ago. In the Netherlands, the proportion of landfill that was construction and demolition was 26%. Think how big landfill is. 26%, one quarter of that came from construction and demolition. That's shocking that we allow that to happen. And, and you know, that's what I mean about this being invisible. You know, how could you think, hang on a second, that's big? It's not, it's absolutely terrible. Um, and this was this was in Brazil again. Boston and Brewers comes from the same paper. And what they looked at there was construction waste as a percentage of the amount of purchased waste. 
So, um, you know, across the age, you, you are wasting 20 to 30 percent of every dollar you spend on construction by throwing things away. You couldn't imagine if, you know, if we as a university said, oh, yeah, we, we, we probably, you know, we'll only look at 70 percent of, of what we spend to be used. And that was our objective. You would think you were, you know, abs absolutely um, irresponsible to do that. And then what they also looked at was the types of waste, where the waste comes from. And I just asked them to look at the fifth one down there, which is mortar. 50% of all the mortar gone to Pinto um, was wasted. 48% had gone to Silver Woman and 46% had gone to Pinto and uh, Agapayan. Half of it is thrown away. But when you think about mortar, I, I, I imagine that many of us have done some building or same building. You mix it. And then you've got a fixed time. So if I mix mortar, if I'm building a wall in my garden, and I mix mortar on a, on a warm day, I'm just going to throw it out a bit away because it's going to go up, it's going to cure before I can actually use it. But think of it like this. If you're pouring, a, a, making a pour, making a driveway or something like this, and you have too little mortar, that's worse. Because you can then, you, you've got a gap which you have to fill, and that gap will not be as... Uh, you know, be a frost trap and all sorts of things. So the system itself is just wastes so much. This is my this is where I live. This is the beach where I live. Um, so on the left there is is Seascale, which is the, the the village I live in, and behind there is Black Coombe, that's the Irish Sea. Um, and this was just an experiment I did to walk on my beach. I walked for three hundred meters on my beach, and this is not everything I found. I just photograph things as I walk past them. So within three meters, I found a huge amount of plastic. All of that plastic is profit. Somebody's making money out of that. Nobody's taking any responsibility for it. There's no externality associated with that for the producer. And if the producer can, you know, have someone throw it on a beach rather than responsibly dispose of it, then actually it's lower cost. So actually that's good business. I mean, we're talking to business lecturers here. That's actually more profit than doing something else. So if you think about that as your as your, as your dimension, then you know that's what you that's what you're going to get. And it's an open system paradigm. We just think of the supply chains being an open system. Things going to be in the, at the beginning of it, and at the end of it, it just it's a thing. We don't know where they've gone. But we don't live in an open system. We live in a closed system, which is called the Earth. We haven't got any option. The, the Earth is a closed system. And imagine instead of that plastic on my beach, it was crude oil. There would be a national outcry, possibly an international activity about that. This is a feature from Greenpeace. But it's not crude oil. It's crude oil products, which are on the beach. It's plastics. But nobody says this is a disgrace, a national disgrace, and we need to you know, have a huge international process to, to clean it up. So we think of, and this is, gets back to you know, what I'm talking about at the beginning, so much of supply chain activity is invisible to us until it really goes wrong, until we see it in a different, in a, in a different paradigm. And just to tie that bit off, this, this comes from, um, uh, it came from the uh, New Scientist. And so 100 billion tonnes of things are used in terms of materials. 90 billion tonnes of what is used is virgin material that comes out of the earth in some way, um, you know, for example, mines, that's the new stuff. Of that, we keep about 30 billion tonnes of it. So, for instance, if you make concrete and put it into your driveway, that's permanent, that's not going to be thrown away. Now we have 60 billion tonnes is discarded. So of the 100 billion tonnes we use every year, we throw away 60% of it, 60 billion tonnes of things are thrown away. One of my, I, I don't like his writing. I don't like the way Stafford B writes, but I really like his ideas. He, he was from Manchester University. Um, he's, he's, he's dead now, but he was a really great thinker. They came up with this absolute brilliant aphorism. The purpose of the system is what it does, called positive with. So all of us Stafford B geeks will say positive with when we see something happening and everyone knows what it is and no one else does. So what I'm, what I'm saying there is that the purpose of the global supply chain is to create waste. That's its purpose. That's what it is there for. 
because that's what it does. So the system creates waste, therefore its purpose is to create waste. And there's lots of different ways. This, this is a, a one I've got from uh, Bolton Halliday. It's a brilliant book, it's Microeconomics by Bolton Halliday. And they looked at this thing in the, in the Second World War, which is an armored truck made by Ford. And what they found was the right hand um, picture is the, the most informative, is that the total language that went into the truck decreased the more trucks they made. So actually, the more you do an activity, we all call it the learning curve, don't we, in business, the longer you can keep that learning curve going, the more efficient you become and the higher your profit becomes or, or you can reduce your um, you can reduce your costs. And supply chains enable this. So supply chains enable it by buffering. So we can say to the factory, just produce, 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 and we will store, 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 and then people can draw from the um, from the, the warehouse as and when as and when they need it. So supply chains also create the buffers, but those buffers de-risk the production process, so they enable production and overproduction. And there was a um, person called Charlie Munger who um, worked with uh, economists, top economists in the US in the 60s and 70s, and what he said was show the incentives and I'll show you the outcome. And you've probably all seen this, you know, that they, they lower the cost, the greater the quantity of anything that's sold, so you reduce the cost that's sold more. You know, the, the idea of the two pound bus fare outside of London means that bus use is, is much higher than it was when it was higher than that. But then the cost per unit as that increases, there's at a point which is equilibrium. So that's the equilibrium point where um, that's the, the, the point where you've actually found the, the correct market price. Uh, for the for the quantity that you sell, but if you can move that um, that blue line down, if you can reduce the cost of production, then you can sell more goods, and that's what supply chains do. So we do it by um, we do it by um, either the ISO container, by the mega ships, division of labour, data platforms, um, just in time manufacturing. So what the supply chain does is it, it moves the uh, cost per unit down, which increases the unit sold as well, uh, which obviously moves to the waste. Okay, moving towards the, the, the close a little bit now, what I'm, this is a proposition, the most powerful intervention in any supply chain is changing the plan. And I often hear, well, you know, what can we do? What can little old Britain do um, in, in this particular area? But when we make that deal, that deal can actually impact all around the world. So it impacts the shipping lanes and it impacts the data information and so on. So, you know, so, so a decision I might make in terms of an Amazon purchase will, will affect the producer in China. So we do actually have a global reach and how we structure our demand is actually a global issue. It's something which we, which we can do. So let's see what we can do. Many people will be familiar with this, um, which is the circular economy principles. This comes from Ellen MacArthur Foundation originally, I think. You know, use less material, use them as long as possible, uh, design products within the black and white so you can recycle them, and you know, ultimately regenerate, make things which nourish uh, the environment. So the answer then appears to be, let's just consume less. Because if we consume less, there'd be less waste. That's the obvious, obvious answer. So when we look at, in terms of the impact, we look at the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals, might be one of the things we look at, the 17 goals. The challenge then is this thing, it's called entanglement, and it's the fact that we are connected to everyone in, in many, many different ways. So an example of entanglement is, you know, good food equals good health, but good food might come from production of natural gas, which generates carbon dioxide and fertilizer, for instance. So uh, CO2 is a byproduct of fertilizer production. So there are things where it's very difficult to actually pull ourselves out of the system. We're in the system. We can't sit above the system and look down on it because we are part of the system. So if we took the UN sustainability goals, every time we change one or more of the goals, the other goals change as well. Yeah, so you, you push one thing and something else moves because it's an, it's an entangled system. 
So what it would say is that if we took, for instance, the um, circular economy, so to close, recycling clause, what does that do for garment workers' family in Bangladesh? Mm -hmm. So what does it do for the farmer that produces the cotton that goes into those clothes? So our um, local solution might well be something which actually affects the sustainability goals across the globe. So, so, so um, we need to think. We need to think hard about this. I'm just going to whiz through this bit. So, so basically, what I'm, what I'm saying is that the supply chains, if you think of them as a system, the system is linked with elements and the connections with the purpose. This comes from. Um, Another Meadows, brilliant book, Thinking in Systems, absolutely fantastic book. It's 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 like a paperback, but it's a you know ripper on read. And Dylan Another Meadows is a, 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 a he absolutely evil of mine. And the idea of this is instead of thinking of elements, think of how the elements are connected and how they behave. Think of the behaviors rather than the actual uh, you know the elements. And this this is work in progress. So so we're going to try to do is to think, well, how do these things work together? So I've got this thing called the range of impact. The range of impact is local, you know, in our community and global across the across the world. And also in terms of human and environmental, we think of working with elements and the system. So you know if we were to look at the uh, local and element that might be I might choose to stop buying one product and start buying another product. So that's just a kind of a it's a local thing and I'm just picking a physical element of it. And then we've got um, local and system. So that might be recycling, re you know, recycling process in a community, um, which is more systemic, more systemic thinking. And that's something that I, I call boundary responsibility. And then we've got things where we have an element in global, which is disaggregated responsibility, where we just pick randomly elements and say, well, I'm not going to buy this in China, I'm not going to buy that in India, I'm not going to buy whatever. And we don't actually have a system operating. We need an integral strategy. We need, absolutely need, something which connects all of this together in a way which can be, um, which can integrate. So things like global social justice has to be part of climate change. Because if we manage climate change locally, we will be um, affecting people in ways which we wouldn't want to affect someone in. So it's new tools, new sources of knowledge, Epistemic communities, the IPCC, for instance, is an epistemic community uh, and systems thinking. This is Dylan Meadows' ways to intervene in the system. It's a really, really important piece of work. It's, and I picked three elements from it. The first thing is the structure of information flows. We do not have good information about how this supply chain works. We do not understand how the goals of the system arise, and we do not understand the mindset or paradigm of which the system, its goal structures arises. So we don't understand how we created the supply chain. The supply chain is not something which has been given to Earth. The supply chain is something that we have built. We have built something which is destroying us. Okay, we, so what's our mindset? What was the paradigm that led to that? And is there a paradigm we can choose which actually changes our ability uh, and our ability to, uh, to manage that. There's, a, there's another fantastic author called David Bohm, who wrote a book called Thought as a System. And his proposition there is that it's not what we think, it's how we think that creates many problems. So this is this is my kind of last point. What would Dale Meadows do? If you haven't heard of Dale Meadows, really check her out because she's a fantastic writer, really, really intelligent writer, and a, a great internal, uh, great systems thinker. So I would say let's look at people who can think systemically, people th think in integrated ways. Ken Wilber is another guy, a little bit odd, and can be, but this fantastic um, information in his books. And it's kind of thinking of let's, let's actually bring this into the visible. Let's bring it into the visible. Let's make it so that we actually see the supply chain. We see it for what it is, and we see it every day, and we actually engage with it every day, not just when it goes wrong. 
Because the thing is, within that supply chain is all the information we ever need. Every single transaction is in that supply chain. Every single production process is in that supply chain. Every single element of waste, every single cause of waste is in the supply chain information. We just don't have it. We don't know where to find it. This is my this is my best source of supply chain knowledge. This is where I learn so much, and it's farming today. Well, firstly, it's on at about five forty-five uh, in in the morning, just after the world service ends. And but the farming supply chain and where this program addresses it is indicative of every supply chain you might want to. Thank you, John. Um, uh, on behalf of everybody, um, I think that was really great, really interesting stuff, and posing some some uh, um, really uh, uh, key conundrums, I think, for us.